those of you, and most of you do this on a, a daily, if not an, an hourly basis, if you go to the Google homepage today, you will find not only the Google search bar, but an advertisement, an advertisement for the Nexus 7, which is, of course, uh, a device which runs on Google's Android platform. So, one is inevitably going to ask the question, is Google a media company, a content company, or a search engine? Now, a guy who's been doing a lot of thinking about this, almost since the birth of search engines, and Google, of course, in particular, is Danny Sullivan. Danny is the... Well, Danny, why don't you introduce yourself, and before we get on to this all-too-important question of whether or not Google is a search engine or a media company, tell me a little bit about your history, how you became Mr. Search Engine when it comes to thinking about all these issues. Sure. Um, I was formerly a journalist and I went off to start developing websites in 1995 and as part of that it was trying to figure out what it was that helped people find those websites. And I started looking into how the search engines were operating because there wasn't a lot of information about them. A, a lot of assumptions on how they worked but, but no real backup or research. And I found the whole thing interesting and started reporting on that into the, the, the site that eventually led into what I'm doing now at Search Engine Land. Um, you know, I was both covering the tips and information that people who were search marketers needed to know, as well as trying to cover the landscape because way back then, we had all sorts of search engines that you didn't know if they were going to be around, much less if they were worth the time to be doing all the submission processes that were involved with them. Would it be fair, Danny, to say that you've gone from one of Google's greatest cheerleaders, a, a Google evangelist, <laughs> to one of its most incisive critics? Um, you know, I've had some people say that. I, I never really sort of thought of myself as a, a Google cheerleader to begin with, and I don't think of myself as some sort of anti-Google person now. I, I see myself as somebody who's common, a commentator on what's going on in terms of the search space. And, you know, if, if, if Google seems to, if it sounds like I'm being more negative towards Google, I guess my response is really, that's just me comment about what's going on with Google. They've been making some shifts there that, you know, deserve criticism and deserve further examination. In the past, they've taken a lot of criticism for things that they really didn't deserve and things that were blown up. And so I, I really try to bring in balance where I think that there's, there's balance that's missing or perspective where I don't see the perspective. Danny, make sense of this Nexus 7 move. Is it something that troubles you or the, the idea that Google is using its supposedly agnostic search platform to advertise products on its own devices or, or operating systems? Well, the homepage thing that they're doing, they've been doing things like that since like 2006. And they've promoted all sorts of products. They've promoted the Droid when it was out there. They promoted the, the G1, the first uh, T-Mobile Android phone that came out. They've promoted things like Firefox uh, when the, the, it came out that's been out there. They had partnerships with NBC that they promoted there. So, you know, this is sort of the latest in how they're making use of the homepage. And it, it doesn't sort of overly concern me. I think what what concerns me more is what the Nexus 7 represents, which is sort of a, a, a gateway to this content that Google's selling. When you get a De Nexus 7 and you launch it up for the first time, one of the things it's directing you to is your content. I mean, I think that's the title screen that it's called. And that's all leading you into Google Play, where Google is selling you books and music, uh, videos and television shows and so on. And, and this is Google being a broker for this content, and it puts them in direct competition with other people who sell this kind of content, such as Amazon or such as Apple. And then that starts opening up questions as to, well, if I'm searching on Google, you know, am I not getting to other people who sell content as well because Google wants to promote its own stuff first? And even it's Google's search engine, so Google can, can do certain things like that if they want to. We certainly have lots of companies to promote their own things that are out there. There are some ongoing arguments and investigations right now into whether there are antitrust issues that are involved with it. But I think you can set all that aside and just say that the bigger question has been Google has always aspired to have a search engine that returns the best content and that users can trust it. And so when it goes into a space where it has these conflicts, does that cause some of the, the user trust to possibly be harmed? Well, here's the all-important question, Danny. Can we trust Google? Can we trust the search engine? Now, in particular, that it's investing in, in, in travel websites, in travel publications, 
and becoming increasingly a major player in content from YouTube to, to everything else. You wrote a very interesting piece at the beginning of the week called How Google Went From Search Engine to Content Destination. And if that is indeed true, then presumably we can't trust it as an objective search engine. Well, nothing's objective, so <laughs> the, the, there well, are what, no... What, what, but, before, but, right. but, but Google was more objective at the beginning than it is now. Is that fair? I don't even know if that's necessarily fair because it's difficult to tell whether or not they have been, you know, neutral, as some people want to say, or if they're favoring their own content more. A, a good example of this is people would see a lot of YouTube content showing up in Google, and therefore they would say, uh, that's Google favoring itself. But YouTube has a lot of content, so it's difficult to tell whether or not it's Google favoring itself or if it's just a byproduct of the fact that there's a lot of content that's out there. You get to all sorts of things that are not Google content. You get to all sorts of websites that are out there that are getting lots and lots of traffic that comes from Google. So I, I can't really assess whether or not they're more favoring themselves or less favoring themselves. Um, certainly, it's fair to say that they have more potential conflicts that they've had, ever had before. And when you have those kinds of potential conflicts, it opens you up to further accusations, which then can go to whether or not your users are going to have uh, trust that may erode in you. Well, if, if you're uh, a writer or an editor uh, for... Uh, the Rough Guide or some other travel publication, and Google, of course, has just bought from us and Zagat. Why would you believe that they are objective? Are they indeed going to be promoting uh, publications like Zagat and Frommer over the other publications? And, and as we know, travel was central in the well, travel. The issue of travel is central in the ongoing EU antitrust investigation. Uh, in those cases, you're not going to feel that they're fair to you. You're going you're gonna to feel like, and you can see that, these other publications have a natural advantage. The, the Zagat reviews are already integrated into Google search results in the way that other publications are not done. Um, and, and that's their platform for building things going up forward. And, and so you're probably going to look at that to some degree of envy. A at the same time, if you're somebody like a, a Yelp, you, you may have been the people who were upset over the fact that Google previously was exerting some of your information and trying to use that as part of their travel thing. So it's, it, it's a very complicated area where you can, you can point fingers at Google and say they're being unfair in one regard, but then when they, if they didn't have their own platform and they started using other stuff, people want to point ac fingers and accusations at them as well. But uh, yes, I think the bottom line is if you're a content owner, and you are in a space that Google now owns content, something it really hadn't done before, you should be nervous and you're going to be wondering what's going on here and whether or not you're going to survive and thrive as well as you did before that happened. And more importantly, for our audience, uh, users should be worried too because when you go to Google and you're planning a trip, a hotel, a, 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 an aircraft fare, you, you want the best search results. You don't want the biased results. Yeah, but and, and I agree with that entirely. But I think that also gets to another thing that I was saying in my piece, which is Google doesn't make any move where they don't think that they're doing the best thing for people. So they'll look at something like a Zagat and they'll think, well, we think this is the best way for us to prevent, present information out to, to users. They, they wouldn't view it, I don't think, in their own minds as if they're somehow not giving users information that's really useful to them or that they don't think it's the best kind of information that's there. But, of course, that's what they're going to think because it's their own content. Right. It has its own logic. They're, gonna buy, they're not going to buy a, a publication or a website if they don't think it's any good. Right. And, and in some cases, it may be very good. And then there are also other arguments that you can get into as to whether or not it works better because they're able to do stuff with their own content um, and, and integrate it better in a way that they can depend on. Uh, an example there is um, when Google rolled out Google Plus earlier this year with the little boxes that were on the uh, right-hand side of the page, Facebook and Twitter got very upset over that, and they felt like, look, this is Google favoring Google Plus and giving it a lot of play. And even I looked at that and thought, wow, you know, you, you couldn't have dropped in some Facebook links somewhere here or Twitter links that are there. And, and Google's response was, well, we can't depend on getting that information. Facebook doesn't open it up to us. We had a deal with Twitter. We built things around Twitter's information, and then Twitter cut off the deal. 
And so we had to take down an entire search product that we had because we couldn't strike a deal in the end to make it all happen. And so they seem to have become very wary of wanting to depend on other people's content, which is how Google got its start in the first place. Danny, what do you make of what's going on in, at the EU? And indeed, the, 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 uh, the antitrust investigations now being launched in D.C. against Google. Where do you see these going? Uh, I think the EU thing will probably get resolved without any action. I think that they're, they're, you need to send us answers right away with sort of a, a, a hey mail, hail, hail, hail Mary play type of thing where we're, we're going to try to get, get something out of this because we've, we've investigated all this stuff and we can't really back it up. It's very similar with the, with the DC things as well. It is hard to argue, as say Yelp did, that Google is harming you and at the same time, it is the primary source of all your traffic. I mean, that was the testimony. It's like, Google's doing all these terrible things to us, and we're only getting 75% of our traffic from Google. It's like saying that CBS is harming NBC because they keep mentioning NBC programs and keep sending 75% of their viewers over to NBC. Those sorts of things don't hold up. And if you really take a close examination to them, you understand how search engines work. That's it just doesn't really, really mesh. The issues on content, which are not really what's been going on here, are different. But I don't think that, that um, the regulatory bodies have caught up with that sort of stuff at all. At all. And in fact, they, even if they do catch up with what's happening now where Google is actually becoming this content company, they may decide, well, that's perfectly fine. Because we did this other antitrust review and all the people who had content were upset because they didn't like Google you know, using their own content. So I guess the solution is Google needs to have their own. So where does Google go next? I mean, in five years, if we have this interview, maybe they might own, what, the New York Times, CBS. Um, at what point does it become self-evident that they not only essentially monopolize the internet in terms of search, but also in terms of content? Uh, I don't know, and, and that was the main point of my, my piece, which was that Google goes into these individual content things and, and they all make sense. You know, I, I did this forest and trees analogy and they keep seeing these trees and they chop down the tree because they think it makes sense and then they fail to understand they've wiped out the entire forest. And, you know, so it makes sense for them to buy a Zagat. It makes sense for them to buy a Frommers. And, and that leads into you having these things that you would have never thought really made much sense at all. The idea that they buy a New York Times because now they need to have better news content. Or that they do decide that they need to buy an NBC because, you know, the best way for us to have the television content for people who are trying to find it is, I don't know, if we own a television, you know, network. So... I, I don't, I, I don't know where the end of that comes to. And I, I think that they're going to continue to make some very big content acquisitions, especially in vertical spaces. And where, that, where would you suggest, Danny, we should look next? Where are the possibilities? I think possibilities are that they try to come up with their own sort of shopping portal, perhaps as a rival to uh, Amazon, because it makes sense if you're offering, if you're offering a, a shopping search service that maybe you have a better experience if you're actually selling the stuff that's that way. Um, I would think that you're going to see them do more, uh, perhaps in other areas where you have comparative types of things. Maybe it makes sense for them to uh, own a, a financial publication so that people can get, um, you know, things like a bank rate, for example, where, where it focuses on taking in all this information and trying to uh, help people figure out their financial processes and, and financial uh, products that they may purchase. You know, Google could say, well, that fits in very well with what we're trying to do there. Um, I'd probably have to sit down and take a close look at some of the other products and services that they offer out there to, to see which way they go you know, further and where they see the, the meshing that might happen. Um, certainly we'll see an expansion in the stuff that they're already doing, which is the entertainment content, definitely. Danny, final question. You, you, you deal with this in your, your brilliant piece, which I'll, I'll link to in, in, in my post on, uh, out of this interview. Um, but is Google more or less evil now than it was when it, when it was founded 12 years ago or 13 years ago? It's the, the, the always fun is Google evil uh, thing. I, well, they, they asked for it. They were the ones who introduced the word. It wasn't me. I, I never really thought of Google as being necessarily evil or good back even when they were doing it, because I don't think you have companies that are necessarily evil or good. You know, they, 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 it's such a big, uh, it's such a big thing to aspire to or not to aspire to. Um, I think that they probably uh, have more conflicts 
than than they had when they started out. You know, they've got they've done more things where they have compromised values that they probably have not wanted to do. China was a great example of that, where you know they went into China and it was like we didn't necessarily want to do this sort of thing. We wanted to cooperate with this, but in the end, it made sense for them to do that.、Um, They kind of gave the wireless industry a pass by saying, "Okay, we we should have net neutrality, but we don't necessarily need it in the wireless space because that's still growing and developing. When arguably we need it there more than we needed it in the regular space." So, I I really hate to say they're less evil. I think that they probably make many more compromises now than they ever did in the past. Well, Danny Sullivan, the man who, at least in my mind, has fallen out of love with Google. Thank you so much for appearing on TechCrunch TV, and I look forward to having you on、uh, in the not too distant future when we can talk about more questions around Google,、uh, antitrust, and how it's becoming a media company. Thank you so much, Danny. For having me.